together. It's a great pleasure to um, be here on uh, Zoom digitally, and um, it has been a great pleasure to contribute a chapter to your um, handbook, which I think will continue to be the um, major work of reference for all things soft power, also empirically, uh, but also conceptually, theoretically. There's so much in there, and I'm I'm very um, pleased and and um, um, that, that that I'm that I'm a part of that. So, um, what I would I would like to talk um, to you all um, today um, is um, something that has been uh, on my mind for 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 quite a while, and that is the role, and that is also perhaps um, one of the reasons why I asked the question earlier. Um, that's uh, talk about the role of the individual in um, soft power. So um, we're all familiar with the uh, with the terms, um, and um, I'm only going to introduce it um, very quickly here. Um, the the idea of soft power in IR and international relations, but mainly what I would like to focus on here really is the role of um, certain individuals. And um, when I first learned about the concept of soft power and um, also had the um, great pleasure of talking um, about it a bit more with um, Joe Nye. Um, we, we always encountered or I always encountered the, the sort of gap that is in, in, um, in literature, especially also in, in Nye's them, and that is the role of um, certain individuals as soft power brokers in their own right, especially today as we see an increasing personalization on the international scene. And um, I think a, a concept or an idea that is in a way as, as far reaching and as opaque and as powerful as is soft power itself is charisma. And I think when we look at charisma as a concept that is about 100 years old as an academic concept, but of course the idea is much older and I'll, I'm going to explain that in a bit. Um, then I think we can find some uh, common ground which helps us to integrate the individual or the person into the soft power um, context or um, building. As it were. And then I uh, would like to also to provide some empirical evidence after that. So one of my topics and this is something I'm, I'm currently working um, on a book about this topic um, and this is um, transatlantic relations so especially uh, for the for the sake of simplicity of mainly german-american relations but we'll also look at transatlantic uh, transatlantic relations at large and um, how charisma charismatic leadership has informed soft power in this relationship because i think there are some excellent examples there also for better or worse it's um, it's something uh, that we'll talk about and then of course some conclusions on the road ahead so what can we um, take for, if anything from that and um, where might we um, be headed in the future what's what's next and um, so this is the sort of agenda the next I think about 20 minutes or so um, and um, as I said before, we talked about soft power um, uh, abundantly already now, and I'm, I'm, I'm only going to quickly um, go over these um, these slides here. Um, what I what I, something perhaps just a few things that I would like to add, perhaps to discussion rather than repeating everything that has been said before, repeating even everything that's on the slides, but just adding a few points, a few um, uh, brush strokes here and there. And one of the things is um, that I think we have to keep in mind that uh, power is so crucial in international affairs. And this is not something only recent events have shown us, but this is one of the constants in world affairs, I think, is the importance of power. Um, and at the same time, it's very contested. Um, it's very um, hard to define the different um, approaches to it different understandings, but is what something that is generally shared um, is the importance um, of power itself. Then there are several um, definitions of power. Um, so um, the definition or the, the number of definitions is as high as perhaps even higher than the people who have dealt with the concept of power over the years, or over the centuries. Um, and these are just two of the most perhaps um, common or um, also influential um, definitions. Um, and um, and you know, we don't have to go through them one by one, but I think something that becomes clear is that there are different types of power. So this is also why this passage here, um, and I, I think and I hope you can see my presentation, right, um, um, is um, why this is uh, printed in, in, in bold letters here, um, that there are different 
ways to affect the outcomes or to affect the behavior of others um, to to speak with these um, uh, definitions sort of uh, tied in or into one. Um, and um, this observation, I think, is very crucial and becomes um, very clear, especially when we look at Joe Nye's definition of soft power, where he defines it or of power uh, in general, where he says there are different ways to affect the behavior of others. You can coerce them, you can induce them, or you can attract them. And this is really something that has led into um, the sort of definition here or the division of power into different varieties. On the one hand, you have the hard power, which simply defined in behavioral terms can be thought of as including coercion and inducement. And on the other hand, you have the soft power side of the power coin, so to speak, um, which is all about attraction. So, um, and this is why attraction is so key in soft power. And attraction is really the, the main reason why you change your behavior. This is the idea um, behind soft power. So you um, change your behavior or you get somebody else to change the behavior based upon attraction. Um, not just the, um, uh, the way to encourage others or buy others. You don't have to um, only do that, but you can um, actually attract others. So there was a note in the chat. Let me check. Is there a question? The shared screen shows the speaker's view. Uh, okay, I think we can change that. Maybe now it's better. Thanks, um, Ellie, for the um, comment. I think now you only have the slides, uh, right? So there were no secrets in the in the speaker notes so far. But thank you uh, for the um, for the heads up, um, Ellie. I think now it's better, right? Um, so. Um, Let's uh, let's let's look at this definition again. Attraction is key, and um, it's all about this magical, powerful thing that is attraction, which um, at the same time, as I said before, is very powerful, but which is also very hard to define. So um, I think um, I leave it at that with the definitions of power or of soft power. But let's look at a few key um, characteristics also to um, move over to the. Um, um, to the um, charisma or how to include charisma within that. So um, I think it's very important to keep in mind that soft power is very much a relational form of power. So what you find attractive, others might not. They might even find it repulsive. Um, think about artifacts like movies. Nye always makes the point in his, um, in his writings that a movie affecting women's right, maybe very rights, maybe very attractive in Rio, but very repulsive in Riyadh. And um, only recently we've seen that um, empirically, um, for example, with the latest Barbie movie, uh, one of the biggest movies um, over the last couple of months or year. And um, it has also elicited varied responses and perceptions in varied, um, various different countries. Um, and some of them, it has been banned and others it has been hailed. So this is just one example how very relational self-power is. So it's very important to take into account your audience. Also, it's contextual. contextual so it doesn't always work. It depends on context. Um, you can't get all the outcomes you want by self-power, even though I think self-power is crucial on the world stage. Not every pr problem lends itself to the tools um, or mechanisms of soft power. It's non-normative, meaning um, it's not neither good nor bad. It's not just a nice form of power, as you might perhaps think at first sight, but it's just a nice addition to the real power. But that's not how I understand soft power. It's a very potent form, and it can be used for downright bad purposes as well. So it's not nothing good about soft power per se. It's long-term and it's intricate. These go together. It works over a long period of time and sometimes hidden, uh, less visible um, perhaps than um, hard power, but no less potent. So I think um, I said that before, of course, um, that it's a potent form of power. And sometimes it may be even more powerful to change hearts and minds to return to that classical um, uh, frame or classical formulation. Uh, it may be much more powerful uh, to change hearts and minds than just paying somebody to do something or forcing somebody to do something. So it may be internalized if you use soft power over a lengthy period of time. If you uh, go that um, down that road, it may be uh, more powerful in the end. And then there are different resources on which soft power usually rests. And, and this leads to um, this sort of 
the taxonomy of soft power, which I tried to uh, propose. And um, what I, I'm not going to um, go into detail here on all the aspects, um, but um, rather um, going to focus um, on two things. One is that, again, it's the relational thing. It's not only just one actor, it has to have a recipient as well. That's important. We'll look at that uh, in a moment with regards to transatlantic relations. And I'd like to address this aspect a little more um, in, in, in a more detailed manner here, because um, I think the role of persons, personalities, individuals, and also personal diplomacy, char charisma is very interesting. And in fact, um, the resource of personalities of individuals, this is also, I think, where charisma comes in. So charisma, um, and this is also sort of the title of the, of the chapter, right, um, can be translated into the gift of great grace. Um, and um, to um, as the starting point, um, I think um, something that has sort of interested me for a long time, but it's also uh, recurrent in, in world politics is the power of individuals. Um, and this is, of course, just a selection of some of the um, the the history making individuals. You can see Alexander horseback, you can see um, Caesar and also Cleopatra, uh, Jean d'Arc um, or Napoleon. Uh, through the ages, so this is about 330 BC, and this is about 1800, right? Um, and um, so 2000 years between, and of course, after that, there are several other examples right up to today where charismatic individuals or individuals also from politics, but also from tech platforms, for example, like um, Musk, we just uh, talked about, or Zuckerberg, are individuals who are very powerful on the world stage and who sort of defy our um, definitions or understandings of, of traditional understandings of power and um, they not usually force others of course these figures um, and this is uh, of course indicated for example by the sword she's wielding or the I think he has a spear in hand here um, even if or he got a sword by his side of course so these figures were conquerors they were um, emperors or dictators or also in the end um, uh, or like uh, um, army leaders. And so they had, of course, huge um, heart power to command and uh, they made inroads in history through the use of heart power. But there's something more to it. So if you read the biographies of Alexander, if you read about Caesar uh, or Cleopatra or especially Jean d'Arc, or also Napoleon, and this is something um, very interesting, perhaps also in, in view of the movie that is about to, to come out, which um, highly regarded or, or um, expected around the world. If you read about the, the beginnings of Napoleon, he was just, just an, an ordinary officer, not even French uh, in the perception of some of his contemporary um, aristocrats and others. So uh, how did he manage to come into power? And if you read his biography, it's um, it's very clear that he was very charismatic, that he had something about him which made others to follow him. Um, for, again, not only the, the noblest of causes, of course, his, um, his um, uh, the many battles he has fought and uh, the, has caused uh, destruction all over Europe. So um, that shows that, of course, this can also lead into um, the death of yeah maybe millions, but there was something um, about these individuals and many others that has made people change their behavior. They were not forced; they were inspired. They were somehow um, convinced or attracted to certain individuals and their ideas. And I think this is where charisma really comes in, and where it can help us understand soft power a little better. So as I said, it translates into gift of grace, Greek um, origin. Um, charis is the sort of root word and um, has religious um, origins um, as we understand it uh, today. Um, Paul writes about it um, in, his, in his letters. Um, and um, there was sort of a long tradition in this, in this concept, but the one scholar who sort of introduced it into sociology, history, also political science, international relations um, was um, German... Um, polymath really, uh, but writer, um, um, scholar, um, Weber, Max Weber. And um, he famously um, distinguished between three forms of authority. He said there's legal authority, meaning you are in power, you, are, you have the ability, the power to command others. 
by your legal authority. So you're elected or um, there's a parliament that is in, uh, based on rules and laws um, or an individual or you're um, in authority due to traditions. So you're, um, you're a member of a royal family or other forms of, of traditional authority where um, it's, it's clear that you have this power by tradition, whatever that tradition may be. And then there's a third thing, and this is what's of interest here for us, that's charismatic authority. So um, this is not resting on laws, not on traditions, but rather on the exceptional sanctity, heroism, or exemplary character of an individual. So somebody somehow attracts others to follow them. And of course, the basic or the most, perhaps the most charismatic individual, also in the religious sense, but um, um, one who also is mentioned by Weber is of course Jesus who for through his writings um, through his um, um, not writings perhaps but through his um, speeches um, sort of created a followership um, which is still very much active today right so um, this also transcends centuries um, and this was also something the, the images have shown political systems, circumstances, we can see this effect or this, this attractive power of individuals through the ages wherever you look and there are certain individuals to attract this. And these are usually exceptional people by whatever, for whatever reason. So there are different types to that. But um, what's most important is um, that there are certain leaders who have a um, followership, who have um, people following them for certain qualities. This is also closely connected to what Naren talked about. Um, sometimes their virtue, their virtuosity. So what the reasons for this attraction exuded by individuals is that it goes a little deeper or is another question perhaps for another talk um, but um, for the sake of um, of our talk here and for for brevity's sake I think I, I'll leave it at that there are certain people who sort of attract um, others to follow them and who believe in that charisma so again it's very relational and this is something we can see if we look at some of the shared qualities of power of soft power and of charisma they're both relational. So um, if you don't have uh, people following you, you're not only not charismatic or considered charismatic, you're perhaps even considered a lunatic. So it depends very much on people following you um, and believing in your power to lead them towards a better future by whatever means, through a religion, through um, companies, through um, buying Apple products, through following somebody into battle through the centuries as an um, army leader or whatever. So there are different types of, of followership, um, but I think it's very important that you have to have an audience who's receptive, who's attributing you with that uh, charismatic um, qualities. Um, your change from change behavior comes from within again, not forced, not paid, but something from within changing hearts and minds again. And all the other things we've talked about also are true for charisma. It's not normative. Some of the most charismatic people in history also are some of those who have caused tremendous pain or death. Um, so um, this is not something that's per se a good thing but it's a very powerful thing and it's very much dependent on the word so this is also something i find very interesting and perhaps something for further research as well the power of the spoken word i think is something that we should also look at uh, in closer detail in soft power research in general also on online platforms for example who has the power to speak uh, and the, what do like tweets or just a few words um, which which power can they um, sort of develop and the same of course goes for the classical political speeches or or even writings so this is something um, very interesting and closely tied to charisma so the most charismatic individuals are also those usually who somehow inspire others and how do they do that often they do it by the spoken word and whether that's on twitter or whether that's on a stage or whether that's on the roman forum that's a matter of context or time but it's basically the same um, same mechanism behind it so for the last few minutes um let's look at some cases um for example german american relations i think is an example that i'm currently dedicating a book to about to to finish with a manuscript but of course the final steps are sometimes the hardest and the longest but um, i'm almost there um, so um, i'm looking at german american relations through the lens of soft power and especially also charismatic leadership and we have many examples how this um, this component or, or or variety of soft power resting on individuals actually influenced German-American relations and still does, even if it's um, 60 years ago, for example, the uh, visit by Kennedy in, in uh, 63, exactly 60 years ago, still very much um, uh, informs German-American relations to this day and had 
best political consequences um, at the time. We can go into detail about that. Um, also, for example, Ronald Reagan. Um, here again, we can have the example, or we, we can see the example of the power of the spoken word, his famous speech in 87 with, uh, in front of the uh, Brandenburg Gate, of course, on the western side of the Brandenburg Gate. Um, um, the, the, um, the picture shows that. Um, which was so influential also in, in creating a, um, a certain atmosphere, which made for, uh, for uh, you know, only a few years later, two, three years later, the fall of the wall and um, the end of the, um, the Cold War possible. So I think Reagan is also a great example. More recently, Obama, of course, um, who spoke um, in 2008 in Berlin on the other side of the same street that Reagan spoke at. So he was denied the Brandenburg Gate, which he wanted to have as a venue. But Merkel said, no, you're not even a candidate for president, much less you are the president. So this was long before or not long before, but weeks before he was nominated as the official Democratic Party uh, candidate and um, she said you're, you're only when you're president you're you get the Brandenburg Gate but you can speak at the other end of the street at the Siegesäule and a couple of hundreds of thousands of people showed up to see Obama and I was one of them actually so I, 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 I uh, drove there uh, and um, and uh, listened um, I took the photo listened to uh, Obama speak and of course this is a prime example of charismatic leadership this um, young um, um, sort of unexperienced um, uh, politicians promising change. This was his main, one of his two main things, right? Hope and change. And these are sort of the, the basic ideas behind charisma and, and, and charismatic leadership through soft power. And he was a prime example of that. And of course, the relationship between the two grew very close over the years, um, um, ending in some of the most symbolic events um, during the, their joint times in office. And we can also see um, actual um, effects of this uh, trend. So if we follow the numbers, um, if we look at some of the um, figures, uh, we can see that the confidence in the US president, which is depicted here for countries UK, France and Germany, um, over the years, um, the Pew Research Institute has been as uh, asking this question once every year. Um, correlates somewhat with the um, con with the opinions of the United States. So the dotted line is the confidence in the presidents. Um, the three um, presidents under, or four uh, presidents under consideration here, Bush until 2008, we can see a steep um, decline until what's the end of his um, tenure and then a rise uh, when Obama came in, uh, in or got into office, got elected and then entered the White House. Then a decline again during the Trump years with some fluctuations in between, which also are explicable, actually, but perhaps we can uh, discuss it later. And then we can um, see a decline during the Trump years and a rise again. So there's something like an Obama, Trump or Biden effect, um, which um, actually reveals that it's not just nice to be liked as an individual or be charismatic, but it actually has um, an effect on the perception of the country as a whole, in this case, the United States. So um, I think um, to conclude my remarks, um, uh, I think personalities matter in soft power. Charisma helps us to understand how soft power works. It shares many qualities, and I think it's a very helpful concept to integrate individuals into the larger soft power concept, um, and because both concepts share key qualities. And um, in transatlantic relations, we have seen um, historically, empirically speaking, that charismatically, uh, charismatic leadership was very important on crucial points uh, in time in the 60s and the late 80s. Also, um, other instances where this charisma was lacking so these are sort of the, to, to speak with Sherlock Holmes, these are the, the dogs that didn't bark, right? Uh, when people are not charismatic, we can also see, or not considered charismatic, we can also see ramification. I didn't talk too much about that, but this is also very interesting um, uh, case in point. And there are some examples in German-Americans relations as well, where the individual wasn't uh, particularly um, charismatic from German perspective. And, and this also had uh, ramifications, but it's hard to uh, measure and determine for sure. Um, so there's something about this. It's some magical power even. Uh, it closely links to virtuosity, to magic, to, um, to also um, pre-scientific uh, pre, um, concepts. So it's very hard, but it's very powerful. And I think it's open for future research. And this is really what the chapter wanted to, um, to do and uh, what I would like to, uh, wanted to talk to, to you about. And I'm very much looking forward to any questions, comments, thoughts, um, whatever uh, you have. Thank you very much.